Welcome to another edition of Cult Nonfiction on Pure FX. Today I have with me Susan McMahon um, of Pittsburgh and Chicago. He graduated from dental school in Pittsburgh uh, a few years ago. Worked... I was going to say, don't say that date. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yes. But, um, and you've got um, cut a few teeth in those years. And I, I see what I looked at your uh, CD there. As the years went by, aesthetics creeped in more and more. And, and, and now it, aesthetics is um, pretty much everything. Is, is, that, is that right? For you? Yeah, pretty much limited. My practice is limited to cosmetic dentistry now, yeah. And and that's what we're going to be chatting about today. It's a really interesting subject. Um, the selfie generation and the smile and <laughs> um, how to, how to um, deal with that. Because, you know, you went to dental school even uh, eight years ago. Instagram wasn't what it is today. And um, you're having much more in general dentistry, having people approaching you who are maybe in their late teens, early 20s, wanting uh, uh, a nicer smile. Is, is that right? Yeah, um, huh? yeah, for, certainly like over the last eight to 10 years, there's been a huge increase in the number of young people seeking out cosmetic dentistry and plastic surgery. So there's, there's actually like a phenomenon um, known as Snapchat dysmorphia. So um, we're seeing, I, I know in my personal practice and um, all the literature bears this out that we're just seeing so many more kids that are coming in asking to have their smiles made perfect. And a lot of them are done with ortho and they have what used to be considered a really beautiful smile. Like 10 years ago, we would have said, oh, that looks great. What are you, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And um, it's just not good enough for them now. Like the standard of beauty has definitely changed. And a lot of that is being attributed to social media. Um, they're you know, compare and despair. When we compare ourselves to the people that we see on social media, we, you know, these guys don't feel like they're measuring up. And oftentimes they'll take their own photos and, you know, they document everything in their lives, all their selfies, and they run them through filters and put those out in the world. And then they come to professionals, dentists and plastic surgeons, and want to be made to look like their enhanced selfie images. So it's really an interesting phenomenon. And, and for me in dentistry, I think that um, mm -hmm. it's really important that we kind of recognize that kids want this. Because what happens in my practice is I see um, younger, like teenagers and young adults that have been to their own dentists and sometimes multiple dentists. And um, they'll say, well, my, you know, my dentist was like, no, you're fine. Um, you don't need anything, your teeth look great. And um, I know I want veneers, they'll tell me. And um, then I went to another dentist and he kind of said the same thing. And he sent me to an orthodontist and I don't want any of that. I, I want veneers. And I think it's important for us to kind of acknowledge that, that, that that's what their desire is. And, um, but at the same time, be really responsible because um, they, these young, younger people sometimes are looking for like the immediate gratification of it and um, aren't really mindful that this is a lifelong um, commitment. If you cut your teeth and put veneers on them, you've got a lifelong commitment to dentistry. And um, so I'm going to talk today about um, a number of cases that are really conservative, but, you know, get the job done, give them the smile that they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely, yeah, interesting and, and a new subject that, um, yeah, if you're not, if you're not prepared for, you can really get caught off guard. And I imagine a lot of dentists are. Um, I, well, it, it's in, in my area, I see lots of patients that have been to other places yeah. and their own dentists and like just weren't getting, uh, I think that, and I understand it, but, you know, you just think um, that when, when someone approaches you and they've got great looking, healthy, beautiful teeth and they say, I, I want to, I don't like my teeth. I don't like my smile that, you know, we're thinking, well, no, those are great looking teeth. So I totally understand that. But um, I think we have to really um, explore that with the patient a little bit to figure out what it is that they don't like about their smile and if we can do something really conservative to get them where they need to go, like, you know, additive bonding or no prep veneer or something like that. But if no, we don't, yeah. my yeah. fear is, and I've seen it happen, you know, if, they, if, if we don't do what they're looking for, they'll continue to seek out opinions until they find somebody that will cut their teeth, right? Yeah. And, yeah. um, and, you know, and I understand that too. They're asking for it. You know, you can deliver an ideal smile with a set of 10 veneers, but um, it's, it may not be in the best long-term interest of that person. 
you know, because they're selfie um, culture and, and they're looking at all these photos, I imagine they're, they're pretty specific and pretty knowledgeable of they want, what they want. And the reason I mention that is, you know, you look at some of these old rock stars from the 70s and 80s and they had bad teeth. I'm particularly thinking of some of the English ones like David Bowie. And then he got teeth and he looked like, you know, oh, you know, just like, yeah, it was aesthetic, but it was too much. Like it was bad aesthetics. And then he had them redone and then he almost looked, you know, it was nicer than his original, but it was less, you know, picket fence white. And you would think it, oh, like, yeah, it's too much. And then he, then he had someone who, more of a connoisseur, gave you a better smile, but not necessarily just a big chiclet in your, in the front of your mouth. And, are they aware of those subtleties or are they asking for, you know, California white and massive, you know, massive big white teeth that are just too much? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I just uh. watched um, Bohemian Rhapsody, speaking of British rock stars with bad teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what, what you see in, in that kind of situation is sort of the evolution of cosmetic dentistry. Mm. You know, back in the 70s, 80s, early 90s, we were like doing those big honking white teeth. And now things have really kind of scaled back a little bit or they were scaling back to a much more natural look. I, I always say that I feel like I have a successful case if you can't tell I was there. Mm -hmm. If someone just says, you have a great looking smile and they have no idea you had dentistry done. That's what I feel good about. But um, there, there is a sort of a new phenomenon happening now. It's the Kylie Jenner phenomenon. Um, and they call it rich face. I, I don't know if you've heard of this. It's, um, you know, if you kind of look at her before and after, she spurred this. But it's really young people, like 17, 18, 19 years old, um, getting Botox and filler. So their faces, we call them um, puffed and plumbed. So they're really filled and their lips are big and they have totally smooth skin and um, they're, they're very young. It's the new, if you will, Louis Vuitton purse of their generation. It's the marker that you, it's like a status marker that you've got um, wealth and status. And, um, you know, we're I seeing know a little bit of- style. <laughs> <laughs> but we're also seeing a little bit of like rich teeth so you have rich face and rich teeth. So I, I do have some people that are looking for like bigger, denser teeth. And um, I, I've been seeing recently um, lots of requests for really like straight incisal edges, all, all incisors the same length and canines kind of flattened off, which I don't care for that look at all. So I spent a lot of time counseling patients on sort of um, like you can have a beautiful, natural looking smile um, and it, it can still be beautiful and it can still look rich. Um, it can still give you the status you want without having that like straight across look because you know, it's, it's the extreme, right? Like that, that, um, that face with all the Botox and the fillers in it is an extreme expression of what someone once thought was beautiful. And it's kind of going a little, it's going pretty far. People, people are still asking for it. And, um, and the same thing with that in dentistry, we don't know, like we have to be mindful of what, the future is for these these young people when they ask for these procedures. That's our responsibility as providers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fascinating, yeah. Just something that is totally new and for me. I'm dealing with abscess and toothache, so yeah. <laughs> so that Colgate picture, you know that Colgate ad with the its, its smile? Mm -hmm. From your perspective, that's a, that's, that must be changing now. Like what's, what's, the, new, what's the new look? Well, the new look is is uh, getting uh, less and less translucent. It's getting like dense and whiter. Oh, okay. Um, and that goes with the people that that have like all the Restylane in their lips because when you've got your lips really puffed, you need to have showy teeth to show through that. Um, so you're casting more shadows, I guess, for the. Yeah, and uh, there's you know there's less less space to <laughs> see, right? When you smile, you're getting less, so you gotta put more teeth in there. Oh, wow. um, but I'm not seeing that a ton in young kids and I'm not, that's not what I'm going to show you today. Okay. I'm going to show you like really livable cases. Um, I'm really keen. Let's, let's, uh, yeah, let's see some of these. Um, okay. Cases. The share, that is a good, can I share my screen? Jump. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you gotta, you gotta. Oh, I gotta, uh, well, what do I have to do now? You make me a host or something. Scare screen. Oh, okay. So I'm, I, I make you a. A panelist trying. 
four. Make the host. Is that good? I've given you. There we go. I've given you power. Okay, <laughs> it's now the season show. There we go. <laughs> Joel is now a sideline for me. Yeah, people will go. not complain about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to start with sort of a basic everyday case. This is the kind of guy I see all the time. Mm -hmm. So he turns up in my office. And um, he's 17 years old. He's with his mom. His mom says, um, I don't think he smiles. He doesn't smile enough. Um, and I think his teeth are really dirty. But she comes to me as a cosmetic dentist because she wants me to do something to make him smile more. Mm -hmm. And we ask this guy, so what's going on with you, Jesse? How, how are you doing? Um, anything going on with your teeth? And you know, he's a 17 year old boy and he's like, hmm, hmm. Says nothing to us, right? Yeah. So we take some photographs, put them up on the screen, and um, we want to assess this guy from a standpoint of global smile design. So I want to look at his whole face and his teeth together, and um, as opposed to what maybe happens in other offices, and including the office that he came from. So, um, you know, we put him up there, and I think, like, generally his teeth are in um, a good orientation in his face, his midline is on, he's got a nice smile line. Um, but when we look a little closer, we see he's got that fractured composite on his anterior tooth. He's got a white spot on his other anterior tooth. Mm -hmm. And um, if we look at his gums, we see those gingival heights are a little bit uneven, that this tooth appears to be shorter than this tooth, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, if we're in a practice where we've got a super busy hygiene department and the hygienist says, I've got a new patient in here and his mom says his teeth are dirty and he doesn't smile a lot, but I looked at his teeth and his teeth aren't dirty at all. Like he's got beautiful gingiva, he's got no plaque anywhere. So I told her, no, his teeth are really clean. He's doing a good job, but he has a broken filling on his front tooth. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're an insurance-based practice here in the U.S., then perhaps you'd say you'd zip in there for five minutes, do a quick run around his mouth. Um, yeah, everything looks great. He's got real healthy, clean teeth, but he's got a fracture on this tooth and we're going to fill it. And I'm going to put a new filling on that. And if you're going to bill that out to insurance here in the U.S., it's like it's, it's about $135 or $145 worth of reimbursement from insurance. And for me to do this, you know, to do it well, it takes me like takes me about an hour to do a nice class four like that. So yeah. like, I don't, I don't really care for the return on my, my dollars for like $145 for, for me an hour of work plus an assistant, you know, it's not, it's not a great situation. And you know, using anybody. cheap and I don't know, I, yeah. I'm sorry. You, you're using t good supplies too, right? Yeah, exactly. In order to get a good result, you have to use, uh, I imagine it's not the Z100 anymore. <laughs> it's good composite. <laughs> I don't think they make that anymore. <laughs> no, no. Um. <laughs> I, I heard on one of the podcasts, they still use it for um, the experiments. Because yeah, they use it for the testing. Yes, but that's yeah. the ultimate composite for. Um, that's the standard of uh, bond strength tests. Yeah. Z100. Yeah. So I have a car, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so. Anyway, they, they make right, another nice composite yeah. now. We digress. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you've got to spend some. You got to use quality composite material for this, right? Anyway, yeah. so like it could go that way, or we could sort of step back a minute and um, think about a little bit more about this kid's um, smiling, uh, maybe about his confidence, how we can affect him and help him put himself out there in the world a little bit. And um, so we look back and, and, and we say, what, what could we do for this kid? And what I want to do for this kid is I want to do a little bit of gingival sculpting, meaning I want to make this gingiva even, because I think that's going to help even out his uh, smile a little bit, give him a little bit more presence in his smile. Um, I want to do something with that visible white lesion there. Mm -hmm. So I can either microbrade it or um, infiltrate it with Icon. I want to whiten all of his teeth because that was his mom's biggest complaint that he had dirty teeth, which essentially they're just yellow. And then I want to fix that composite on number eight. Mm -hmm. So we sort of package that together as a full treatment, a smile enhancement. So I'm going to do all of these things. And it really doesn't take much more of my chair time at all to do that. 
So the whitening's happening in my hygiene chair. It takes me about half an hour to get rid of that visible white lesion and to do the sculpting on, on his um, tissue with a diode laser. So I'm just gonna take away a little bit of free tissue to make it even. And then the composite's gonna take me the same amount of time. So when we bundle all that together in our office, the fee to do this is somewhere around $1,800. Mm -hmm. And um, what we get is, so we're gonna do some whitening for him. Mm -hmm. And here he is after. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, looks nice, huh? Um, that, is that immediately after, like? Uh, that's a post-op. So yeah. this, is, this is weeks after. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so you see like um, his before and after, it's, it's, it's a subtle difference. But it's um, from from top to bottom. I think it's enough to make him smile and feel great about himself. If this was a kid that came to me and said, "I really um, want to have perfect straight teeth," I would have probably talked to him about putting veneers on his forefront teeth. But it, that wasn't the case. So you know, we're kind of trying to um, balance what what we can do and what he needs and what his desire is and what the benefit to him is. So really um, completely additive case. And I think we have them side by side before and after. Like you can see in his eyes what a difference it is. He's smiling for us a second time and he just feels better about himself. Um, yeah. And then the, the good thing for dentistry is, is um, you know, we, it's, it's, uh, it's profitable for us and it is, um, good for him. It's boosting his self-esteem. Yeah. Him. Yeah. So it's... like a, that's an everyday case. You know, that's something that I think we all see in our offices. And I, I guess, um, my message here is that we just have to maybe take, take a little bit more time with our patients if we're going to, um, and, and really educate our staff to look for this too, for these sorts of things that can help them feel better about themselves because they don't always say them to us. And, um, and can also um, be nice cases for us. So I got to take my time and it took me like an hour and 15 minutes to do that class four. And I was proud of it when I was done and happy with it. And I think it made a big difference for him. Yeah, and, and you did all that in uh, one appointment? Um, it takes a couple appointments. So yeah. the, wait, the whitening is two appointments. Oh, sorry, the whitening, yeah. Whitening is two appointments. That's separate from me. So that happens in the hygiene schedule. Yeah. So if we have a guy like this that has that visible white lesion on his front tooth, we talked to him about it beforehand. Um, because when we start to whiten, that white lesion is going to look whiter. Yeah. Um, and we always tell them, as the body of your teeth whitens up, it's going to blend in. And then when we're finished whitening, I'm going to do something to that white lesion. So we whiten him over a period of uh, two visits with some at-home whitening in between. And mm -hmm. then he comes in for the gingival sculpting. Mm -hmm. So that's done with a little diode laser. Um, the visible white lesion and the class four all happens at the same appointment. That's all what's it, that's in my chair. Yeah. So, um, the, you know, there's two ways to deal with those white lesions. Um, we uh, used to frequently microbraid them, use a uh, pumice of um, silica material and acid um, under rubber dam, and you could, um, it's superficially taking off the enamel and you'd remove them. Now, more frequently, we use a product called Icon from DMG, and it's a resin infiltrate that, um, that gets sucked down into the white lesion, and it's, it's a really nice, it works really well um, without removing any enamel. So I do that pretty frequently these days too. So three appointments, two of them in the hygiene chair, one in my chair. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's a remarkable result. And I guess with the rubber dam, what's, uh, that, that alters uh, the aesthetics, right? So do you have to, how do you balance that? With the rubber dam in place, is it hard to get the match, the, the, the color oh, right? So I put, put the rubber dam on, uh -huh. get, get, the, get rid of the visible white lesion, and then mm -hmm. take the rubber dam off yeah. and do the class four composite. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. Yeah. 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 Sculpt, sculpt him first. So I'd give him a little bit of anesthesia, drop a little bit in his gum line, and then just, mm -hmm. you know, of course, measure for biologic width. And I think we'll have a slide further on that'll talk about that just a bit. Um, and then sculpt that tissue out, put the dam on, get rid of the visible white lesion, and then just bond the composite. I guess yeah. I could leave it on to bond the composite too, but I didn't. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's just it'll, go, it'll go no further. We'll edit that bit out. Okay. <laughs> this is this is like a, a typical case for me of um, of kind of what we've been describing. Younger people that have 
absolutely beautiful smiles, been through orthodontics. Um, she might have a tiny bit of relapse here, but she, um, she's a faithful retainer wear and she just doesn't love her smile. I mean, it's a beautiful girl and with a beautiful smile by anybody's standards, right? Yeah. But not loving it. So when we get a little bit closer and then she comes to me and tells me why. I don't like how my front teeth are uneven. And I also don't think there's enough oomph in my smile. Like it's just not enough. Like you can't see it enough in pictures. So, um, you know, what do we do with a case like this? Pristine, beautiful, healthy teeth, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, and she came to me looking for veneers. So in this case, um, and you see her lateral incisors, they're not, they're certainly not small or, or pig or anything like that. But um, I, I could understand how we could give her a little bit more oomph in her smile and make her feel better about herself, uh, make her feel like she's uh, more confident in her smile, if you will. And as long as I can do it without any prepping on a case like this, I'm all in. So in this case, we used a technique um, called a uveneer. It's prefabricated templates for anterior teeth. And um, there's two generations of this. This kit's been out for probably five or six years and I never really loved the first kit. Um, I didn't really use it because I always thought I could do a better job with my own hands, just freewheeling, freestyling veneers. But um, I sort of am in love with this new kit. The new kit has surface texture built into the um, template. So as soon as you use it, the whole finish is much more natural looking. So I. And I, and I like the way these fit better. So I really like this. So you know, you, what you do is just select the size that fits best to her teeth and where you wanna go with them. So I'm looking at a size that's a little bit bigger than her actual teeth, but the mesial distal is about the same. So I'm sizing it up there. And then I'm gonna restore, I'm gonna be additive composite to her four front teeth with no prepping at all. And um, the, the way I decide we can do this is because if you look at her canines, um, and back, I think they look great. And you see how her laterals are slightly lingual to her canine. So I think we definitely have room there to add to those laterals, add to her centrals, put the length on her central and still have it look really natural. So, you know, this is a one at a time kind of thing. You simply isolate the teeth and that's just a little bit of Teflon, teeth, Teflon tape. I'm gonna etch and then I'm gonna put the adhesive on and air off the solvent and cure it on. And then you just take composite, and in this case, a single shade, and I'm using a, um, a white enamel. So it's a translucent composite shade, but it has a little bit of a white tint to it. So you load it up into the mold, and you have to press it in there really well, making sure you don't leave any air voids or anything. And then you over, over stuff it a little bit. Um, mm. If you've ever made cookies in a mold, it's the exact same thing. Um, huh. You just over stuff it a little bit. You probably have. Yeah. Um, and then you take that mold and, you know, very scientifically smoosh it onto the tooth. Um, and you're going to get some excess all the way around and you take an explorer or a very thin instrument and clear the excess. And you just really make sure that that mold is snug on the tooth, kind of checking where the margins are and cure right through it. Just cure it on and it comes out like that with you uh, see, um, I know, doesn't the surface look beautiful? Uh, and you get a little bit of a uh, flash around the edges and you have to finish that off. And um, I have a technique that I, I love to use that I learned um, from some Italian friends of mine. Mm -hmm. um, you take a coarse burr and um, spin it really slow and dry and simply clean off the excess. And if, I'm gonna go back one. If you, these, these molds are, have sort of heavy surface anatomy built into them, and that allows you to leave it heavy or to scale it back a little bit. Maybe you don't like that much surface anatomy, and sometimes I get blowback from people. I love a lot of surface anatomy, but sometimes patients are like, what? Why are all these bumps in my teeth? Um, mm -hmm. So you can scale it back a little bit right. with this coarse diamond. You know, so you take the coarse diamond, you prep, or you um, finish a little bit with that, and then you go through, excuse me, two finishing wheels, a medium and then a fine wheel and then a little diamond paste. And it looks like that. So, and you see how I, I um, just nicked that tissue just a little bit when I was finishing, but see how much 
more present that tube looks now. Yeah. Um, it just it has a little more oh, a little bit more brilliance, if you will. Um, and then just one tooth at a time until you're done. We finish them up. So here's all four of them done day of procedure. And then here's the four of them uh, post-op. You see how that tissue heals beautifully. The surface texture looks like natural teeth. Um, you know, I think it'd be hard pressed to um, say they, they weren't natural teeth when you're more than, you know, when you're a little further away. Um, yeah. And I still like um, the embrasures, the, the occlusal incisal embrasures. I always like a little space here. Um, if patients let me keep this, I do. If not, I'll, I'll square that off a little bit. Yeah. But you know, here she is before and after. Yeah. Um, it's subtle, but it's 100% reversible, 100% non-prepping. And yeah. um, this is a girl that loves her teeth now. Wow. Yeah. yeah I can the see that I, there. Yeah. That's pretty cool, huh? Um, th the other thing I like about this a lot, like I, this used to, this took me an hour to do this whole case. Mm -hmm. So it's very fast. Um, I used to do these by hand and I used to think I was really good at it, but, um, and I, and I sometimes enjoyed doing it, but it would take me four hours, like to do a beautiful direct veneer that took a long time and, um, a lot of isolation and, um, I'm getting, I think even a better result in one hour of time. And it sort of evens the playing field for dentists, all dentists, you know, if say, say, you know, artistic sculpting isn't your thing like that's you're not the best at that now anybody can deliver these results with with kind of these template kits so um you know technology is helping us yeah no definitely that that uh yeah i can see how that it gets you so close to being right and then you just have to tweak it a little bit with the those little templates but yeah i mean the art of dentistry is being able to pick the right one and, and, yeah. and still yeah there's still some skill and yeah, I, I, I can relate a little bit because yeah, when you're focused, focusing in on the minutia of it, you can often lose the big picture of the aesthetics. And I, I, I do endo aesthetics, so it's often the interior is like, if someone's on one cleanup to be my chair, it's very square and then you take off the rubber dam and it's like they've got this placard for a tooth and then they have the natural ones, you gotta cut everything back. Yeah. And so how much bigger, uh, uh, are these teeth uh, like buccal surface? Like, is it we took them? Like, right. How much did I add to them? Yeah. Well, probably about a millimeter, I'd say. Okay. So this is all a single shade of composite. Mm -hmm. It's all white enamel, mm -hmm. and I'm adding like um, you know, I'm adding about a, a millimeter of composite, I'd say. Probably mm -hmm. a little bit more at the gingiva. We can back up maybe. Yeah. See, it's a little. You know, I'm adding a little bit of contour to the, um, especially the laterals. You see how they're really built out. They're probably a millimeter and a half. But the yeah. same is about a millimeter. Yeah. Yeah, that mesial uh, aspect of it has, yeah, much more, like you say, contour anatomy. And there's, there's some bulk in there with that contour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. so with this veneer, you didn't, the incisal edge is not added too significantly. Is that right? On more. number and the, on the right central, no, it's probably about the same length. The left central is yeah. about a millimeter longer. Yep. Okay. And precaution wise, uh, what precautions like um, apples, no, or corn, no? Oh, I always tell these patients, I don't want you to bite into anything um, that you'd use one tooth for, like a hard carrot, a hard pretzel. I always tell them, just use your side teeth for that. But I say, go ahead and bite into a sandwich, a pizza, an apple. I'm okay with any of that. Mm -hmm. And they're really durable. I've had no like stability issues with this at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. I tell the same for, for porcelain veneers. I give them the same advice. Don't bite into anything that would be biting on a single tooth. Um, and when people have broken their porcelain veneers for me, it's always been on what, what comes to mind, I had a, a patient that was like forever trying to open crab claws with her veneers. Um, yeah, like crazy things that would break anybody's natural teeth, not just their veneers. So yeah. they're really pretty durable. If you leave enamel, you know, if you're bonding to enamel like this, these restorations are incredibly durable. Um, it's porcelain or composite. If you're bonding to prep teeth, 
Um, if you're trying to bond to dentin, if these teeth have been prepped through the cingulum um, or the marginal ridges, then the teeth, you know, they have a little bit of torque to them and they just don't have the same durability. So, you know, what you, 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 if you save the enamel, your restorations are gonna last longer and it's better for your patient. It's just better all the way around. So with our materials these days, you can do really thin restorations and, um, and not cut enamel. Wow. And this is Volvo composite they used? Or well, what type of composite did you use? Like Fobel well, or? Composite. I didn't understand what you were saying. Now oh, I get it. Composite. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is um this is a universal uh, paste composite. Just a, a universal. This was okay, mosaic. Okay. Yeah. This was mosaic from Ultraden, but it's absolutely just um it's a universal um you know microhybrid composite, not flowable. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 So the drawback of let's, I mean, pardon my ignorance, but foldable is just not on starter here because uh, of physical properties of foldable. Like if you were to put it, like it's just, they don't stand up to the test of time. I I have never tried a foldable in a, in a, um, yeah. a mold like this, yeah. but I don't think that would you'd be able to get the same, um, uh, I, I don't think you'd be able to like keep the same depth thickness. I think the, that the mold would kind of, uh, just flush onto the tooth. Yeah. You know, with the with the with the um, the paste you're getting, you're you're able to kind of um, determine how thick you want that. And I'm not sure we get the surface texture either out of the flowable. I think it might. I don't know. I can give it a try. I'll let you know. <laughs> well, it's probably a question anyone in aesthetics would not ask. Is like, oh, that's so. But do these um, templates I'm come one with? More. Recommendation. No, polishability would be there either. So no, no polishability. Oh yeah, yeah, no, yeah. But do they do they recommend composite, or have you have you drawn have you developed your own that you like? Because how how did your selection come about? Which composite to use? Yeah. Um. I guess my I I, I like the I like three or four brands of composite, and I have them all in my office. Yeah. Um. Sometimes it's shade. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it's finish. Sometimes it's it's handling for me. There's a couple that um, I, I absolutely love the handling of, and I use them on every posterior restoration. Um, but they're a bit too translucent for this. Like I wanted to have a little bit of white in this, so it was about color for me here. And I love the finish on this too. And this will hold the finish for for years. You know how, and you probably see it all the time too. Over time. Um, composite will just lose its sheen a little bit, right? Yeah. And um, sometimes you'll pick up some staining. And this polishes beautifully. And we keep um, polishing wheels in our hygiene room. So, um, you know, once every three or four years, um, when we see these patients come through hygiene, I'll just pop the polishing wheel on and we'll, we'll spin it and, you know, really bring the shine back up again. And, and they tend to hold really nicely. Uh, now, all things being equal, um, this is an ideal result for you. You wouldn't necessarily think that you could get a better result with porcelain or like just, you know, you just, if you just look at those teeth and you kind of took the person away from me, you're just talking about it. Uh, how, how would, how would a porcelain relate to this case? So you just think no, what I'm doing with the composite here is, is fantastic. So two, two advantages to composite. Mm -hmm. um, one is the cost mm -hmm. and the and the second is the time. Yeah. So this is a single visit, uh, one third the cost of porcelain restoration. Mm -hmm. So 22 year old girl, she 23, I guess, 23 year old girl, mm -hmm. really appealing. And I think I can get the results she wants in this composite. Um, so that's why I present her with this. Um, it, what could I do differently with porcelain? If I had to add a lot of length to this case or fill spaces in, a lot of space, then I would have probably been um, leading her toward porcelain because, you know, length is always hard to sustain an unsupported composite if I had to add a lot. And, yeah. um, but, but value and time, two big ones for this. And you get the results, they're there. So this still, you know, even though this costs about a third of what it would cost in porcelain, this I probably, um, 
you know, cost wise, this is a probably better situation for the dentist than to do porcelain veneers because I'm spending, you know, large, a lot, a lot on lab fees to get the porcelain that I, you know, that I want. And it yeah. sounds as though the porcelain wouldn't necessarily in this case bring too much more to the table than you've already attained with the composite. So. I agree with you. I think that that's a big factor. Yeah. Okay. I don't think I could have done much better in porcelain or much okay. different. Okay. Well, that's, and that's if I were going to change it to porcelain, I would use this as my model for porcelain because I, I like the, I really love the contours of this case. You know, and I think it looks really perfect on her. Like it just looks like it belongs on her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So yes. if you could try to imagine her teeth with completely um, straight line angles and flat edges, you know, it just it would look artificial on her, I think. And this one just looks like it belongs. So that makes me feel good. Yes, yes. There's not enough Botox in that face and filler for <laughs> none. the white wall, right? right. She's got none. 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 Yeah, none. exactly. Yeah. Just so it's a natural face. Yeah. It's got to fit the environment. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's excellent. Okay. okay. Okay, this is this is my how are we doing on time? Oh this it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My um, time is your time. So uh yeah. Okay. Um so this is like this is a porcelain case. Mm -hmm. So it's a um this is a start to finish kind of the whole process situation for us, right? So here's a guy who has what right, would think those are nice looking teeth in, in and yeah. any, any other place, right? But um, he's got a couple specific issues with his teeth. He does not care for that tiny black triangle, that, that little black dot between eight and nine. Mm -hmm. And um, he also doesn't care for the shape of his central incisors. He thinks they're too convex. He thinks they're too rounded. He says they look like, um, um, I forget what he said to me, like shells, I think. And then um, he thinks his lateral incisors are too short. He doesn't like that they are um, shorter than the other teeth. And you see his left lateral incisor has a lot lower gingiva than his right lateral incisor. He's got like even a little bit more gingiva all the way back on this side. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so he feels a little bit uneven. Um, wow. So this is a guy that has, um, you know, put some thought into this and really, you know, taken a good look at his gum, his gums and his teeth and thought about things that he wanted to change. And he came to me looking for veneers. And I think he's a, he's a good no prep or minimal prep veneer case. Cause I think I can do what he needs without really changing the structure of his teeth a lot. I can mo make it mostly additive. And if we look at this case and um, think, could we do this in composite? And this guy's whitened a number of times too. So he's whitened to here and he's not really happy with that little bit of white banding um, near the incisal edges of his front four teeth. And um, he wants brighter overall teeth. He wants whiter teeth overall too. And um, you know, once you've reached the maximum amount of whitening you can do, there's really, you know, we're really starting to talk about covering those teeth to get to an, the next shade level. Is that, so, is that banding a symptom of uh, bleaching over time? No, I think this is, this is banding, this I think, do you see how it's like a, mm, like three millimeters up his centrals and just on his laterals? Yeah. I think that it probably was a, a some sort of effect of um, something happened when these teeth were developing. Maybe he you mm -hmm. know spiked a fever or something, but just because it's only on those teeth, and you could probably see it, you actually can a little bit. Mm -hmm. See, you see it on his uh, six year molars a little bit there too. Yeah. Yep, in the same kind of position developmentally. Okay. So um, chronologically, I guess. No. So this is a veneer case, right? Oh. And um, for me, this is a veneer case, but I yeah. want to do it so ultra conservatively. He's about 24 in this picture. So we're going to evaluate the smile from the same perspective, like look for it um, through global macro micro and the pink aesthetics. What can we do for this guy? Mm -hmm. And when we have these considerations, we want, you know, I, I, I sort of go through this list each, every time. I absolutely want minimal preparation. I want it to be durable. Of course, we have to satisfy him. It's got a function and I want it to be easy on him too. I guess I want it to be easy on all my patients, but especially on these younger people. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about um, composite versus uh, minimal prep ceramics. 
on this one. So I know I want to whiten him. I know I want to do a little bit of gum sculpting either way. I'm going to even out this gum tissue. And um, I also, like if we were to try to do this in composite, I'm not sure that I could put as much length on this guy as I wanted to, because I, I really want to add about two millimeters to that. And I want to build it out facially too. And I want to add about a millimeter to that one. And then the whole surface of these um, central incisors is kind of convex. And I want to do something about that. And this guy told me that he really wants that straight white look. Um, he likes that stronger look, excuse me. And he had pictures of some smiles that he liked. And I always ask him to bring those, like show me some pictures of people whose teeth you really like. And then I have a, I can have a really good idea of how to start the conversation with that. Mm -hmm. So we decided we're going to do um, minimal prep, almost no prep veneers on these teeth. And, um, you know, we go through this records and preparation. So we take a bunch of photos. Um, I'm going to take study models or digital scan models, and we'll show how both that's done. Then we sign consents for everything. Um, whitening, cosmetic treatment, the gingival sculpting, and any general dentistry that we may do. Um, he's consented for all of that. Then I've got to get ready for his appointment. So that's what we take at the records. And then I spend about, I keep about a week in between the prepping and, and um, the records appointment. And he always makes the payments arrangements at the records appointment. So we kind of get that out of the way. And before I put any work into it too, I like to know that we're kind of set in that. So then I'm going to design his teeth. I'm going to take all the information that I talked to him about and kind of, you know, my expertise and um, figure out what I want his smile to look like. And then I'm going to decide how I'm going to make provisionals for him and then kind of think about what material I'm going to make. And um, the question always comes up, do you need provisionals? And in these no prep cases, you don't need provisionals, but I, I want provisionals because I want to get an, I want to make sure that what I think he wants is what he actually wants. Um, because that you can talk about it and talk about pictures, but until it's in his mouth and he sees it in his mouth, it, it's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily click. Right. So this is kind of an old school way. I, I'll wax up my teeth myself in about 15 minutes. It's not, it's not any showy wax up or anything. I'm not going to win prizes for my wax ups, but I know that, um, I know I'm kind of looking for that straight across look. And then I take that wax up and I'm going to make a stent from it out of a clear bite material. And, um, you know, I put it in the tray, load it up with the clear bite material, sink the cast into it and just let it set up. Mm -hmm. And from the clear bite material, I can use this as a prep guide and I can also use it as the stent for my provisionals because it's made from my wax up. So in this case, I'm going to use an injection technique. So I take a burr and just drill a hole in the incisal edge of each of the teeth that I'm going to put uh, veneers on. The other way to do it is digitally. We take yeah. photographs, we do some digital smile design, and um, you know we can make these cool little things to send home with him. Mm. Give him an idea of what he might look like. Yeah. Before and after. Um, I, I, patients, especially these younger younger people, love this stuff. They're yeah. snapping it out to everybody. They're sending it out to everybody. <laughs> it's not necessarily um, an exact replica of what we're going to get. It's more of a more of a diagnostic tool and more of kind of a preview tool. So um, you can do it either way. And if you're going to do it digitally, you can get some prep guides and you can get stents to make provisionals from all from the lab. They'll make that all up for you. Um, and then first appointment for this guy is whitening his teeth. So yeah. I'm going to whiten him again, try to get him as high as I can um, on his lower teeth because I'm going to try to get those upper teeth in the, you know, in, in a really nice white shape for him. So I'm going to isolate and go through the whole process. Um, he's going to whiten in my office. He's going to go home for five days using material at home. He's going to come back and whiten again. Then we're going to stabilize about a week. So two weeks out, then he's back for his prep appointment. So he's been stabilized and um, he's whitened and then he comes back for his prep appointment. And on prep day, we're gonna do a whole bunch of things. We're gonna take a shade mapping first. 
Um, we're going to do the gingival sculpting. I'm gonna do that absolute minimal prepping. Then I'm going to take a prep shade, even though I've hardly taken anything off, but I want my ceramist to know exactly what color that is underneath so he can select the appropriate ingot to get it to the color we want it to be. Then I'm gonna take an impression or scan of the prep teeth, a bite registration, and then I'm gonna provisionalize him so we can look at it together. Um, so first thing is some shade mapping and we're gonna take some photos for the lab. Mm -hmm. And then um, what we're gonna do is gingival sculpting. And you know, just kind of a word about idealizing gingiva. For me, like I think it's really important that the gingiva is symmetric. I'm not always so worried about teeth being symmetric. I think eight and nine, the two central incisors, have to be um, have to be pretty symmetric. But everything else just needs to be harmonious. But if the gingiva is off, if you've got one tooth significantly shorter than the other, especially on his incisors, um, it, it sort of looks wrong to our eyes. So I oftentimes, almost every aesthetic case, I am touching up the gingiva with a little sculpting to make it um, idealized, if you will. And by that, I mean that the, if you were to draw a line across the height of contour of the gingiva of the anterior teeth, the canines and the central incisors would fall about the same height and the lateral incisors would fall about half a millimeter below that line. Mm. It also looks perfectly okay if they're all about the same height which doesn't look, what doesn't look okay is if the contralateral teeth are not equal to each other. So that's the height we wanna go for. And then the height of contour, so that the zenith of the crest of the gingiva on the central incisors is about a millimeter distal to a line bisecting the midline, if you're looking at it straight on. The laterals, it's right on the midline. And the canines, it's a little bit distal to the midline as well. So central and lateral, central and canine, distal to the midline, lateral right on the midline. So we're mindful of this when we're sculpting. So we look at this guy's teeth and we see that his canines and centrals are about the same height. I think his right central is just a hair shorter. So I'm just gonna touch that a tiny bit to bring it up to the same height as this but his lateral incisors are definitely different. So I'm gonna sculpt this one about two millimeters to make it match this. And when we do any sculpting at all, we have to be mindful of the biologic width or yes. we cause problems, right? So uh, we know what the biologic width is. It's about a millimeter of epithelial attachment, about a millimeter of connective tissue, and we need about a millimeter of sulcus depth um, remaining in the free gingiva to not violate that. So if we take a probe on that left lateral incisor and I get about a three and a half millimeter probing depth, I know I can take away two and a smidge more of tissue and, and still have at least a millimeter of free gingiva there. I'm not gonna violate the biologic width. If I were to probe that and it was only a two millimeter probing depth on my Explorer, then I can't do this with a laser in my office. I gotta send it to the periodontist he will do a little bit, he'll flap it, he'll do a little bit of bony reduction and then replace it and, um, and that will heal to the correct biologic width again. But this case, he's got enough and I can do it with my diode laser. And that's what I'm gonna do. Just gonna um, anesthetize him a little bit and with the diode laser, remove a little bit of that tissue to make it even on the other side. Um, so here he is, evened out on the other side. And these are also prepped. So you can see how absolutely minimal prepping we're talking about. Yeah. I, um, I really like to have a finish line on my teeth. So I always scribe a finish line for my ceramics. If you look really closely, you can see it up there. It's a super light chamfer, but it no, then I know I have a positive seat when I put my veneer on there. I just like to work like that. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna take some prep shades. The teeth have been prepped a little bit. It's basically the same thing in this case as the pre mm. Um, And then I use my laser just to trough everything out a bit. Instead of packing cord or using clay, um, you can use your laser to do this. And when you use a diode laser, um, and if you're um, using it at a low wattage, um, the tissue is gonna stay exactly where you put it. It's not gonna move at all. So I know I'm gonna put my margin there. I'm gonna trough around it. When I come back, it's gonna be just where it was before. 
Then I'm going to impress or scan him. And then I'm going to take a bite. Oh, this is an old school bite registration, facial alignment for my ceramist. And then I'm going to, so he's all been, he's been prepped and you can kind of see the finish lines here a little bit, um, you know, the end of the prep lines, but I want to provisionalize him so I can give him a preview, a prototype of what I think he wants to look like. Um, Cause here's a guy spending a lot of money to look different, um, trusting me to understand that. And I want to, I want to nail it for him. I want to be sure. Um, so uh, spot, I'm going to spot etch. I'm going to put a little bit of fourth generation resin on there, adhesive resin, no primer. So it only sticks a little bit where I spot etch. And the resin on the rest of it just acts as a little bit of a sealer because I have um, roughened parts of these teeth up. So I don't want any sensitivity at all. I'm going to cure it. Then I put my stent on and take some flowable. Here's my flowable, Joel. Yeah. See how you it. There we go. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I'm going to take some flowable and just inject it right into the holes that I've put in that prep into the, um, into the stent and squish it in there. I'm going to do it for all four teeth, cure it on, and then finish and polish the same way I finished and polished that, uh, the actual composite veneers. Same, oh, wow. same process. Yeah. And, um, so here he is in his provisionals. I'm going to send him home like this and, you know, say, uh, have him come back in three to five days, usually, and sometimes five to seven, depending on the person. Um, do you like this? Is this what you had in mind? We never do this the same day because it's anytime you change, it, it, there's always an adjustment period. And, I, you know, we always tell people that it's going to feel a little funny. It might even feel like you're touching your lower lip a lot. Your teeth might feel long. You might feel like everyone's looking at your teeth. Give it a few days. You won't remember what it looked like before and you can really evaluate it then. So send him home three to five days later, he comes back and we talk about, do we like them? Don't we like them? I take photographs before I send him home too, because I want to look at them and decide if I like them or not. Mm -hmm. uh, we both wanted to make his uh, left lateral incisor longer. Um, see how it's, it's a little yeah. shorter than the other one. So, um, we both wanted that, but he really liked this square, sort of look, this really sharp, heavy incisal edge. Um, so we send him home three to five days later, he comes back and we have a, um, if we like them, he likes them. We have him sign a consent that says, I approve these, it's a little bit more than this, but you can go ahead and make my final restorations. Kind of closes the door on, um, on people's wanting to make changes. They know yeah. there's consent, they know the finals are being made. It's, it works well for everybody. Then I take an impression or a scan of those temps, take a lot of photographs of the temps, and then all of that goes to the ceramist. The photos of the patients, all the shade mapping, the impressions, the impressions of the provisionals, the photos of the provisionals, and then I tell them what kind of material I want. So I am giving him everything he needs, right? He knows what we want them to look like, the exact size and shape. He knows um, what color is underneath. He knows what color we want it to be. And then it's just a matter of picking the right ingot and copying what we've already given him. It makes this whole process really predictable and patients have a lot of input in it and um, makes for um, a really smooth procedure for all of us, for everybody involved. So here he is, he's back to get his permanence in. And you see how nice his tissue has resolved in a few, this is about 10 days later. So we pop off those temporaries and um, you see right where we had that spot etch, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of composite. So I'm polishing it off with a disc. So those teeth are perfectly clean again. And then I like to um, use a paste retractor. This is uh, Expacil, I use Traxidin too. We leave it on for four minutes, rinse it off. And then and that's, that makes a perfectly dry feel to cement to. So that even if it gets etched on it, it's not going to ooze or bleed or anything. It's just a super dry feel. And we're going to use an adhesive resin cement here. Um, a little clinical tip, when we try these on, we squirt the try-in paste on the teeth instead of on the restorations. It's just easier to put it on the teeth and then to put the, then to put the restoration onto the tooth than it is to try to fill it up and squish it on there. So here they are in his mouth. We're cleaning up the try and paste a little bit. Do, and then, do you have a sequence that you cement them that you like that rewards you? Like it's a one at a time, all four at once? Um, I, I, I do, sometimes I do one at a time. I never do more than four at once. Yeah. 
So, um, but I'm trying these on first because he's got to approve them before we put them in. Ah. So this is try and paste. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, you know, just like, you know, it's like a, a Vaseline, colored Vaseline that allows them to stick on there well enough. And then we have them look at them. And we always have them look at a mirror that's hanging on the wall. I never hand them a mirror in their mouth because it's such a distorted view. And this, this is a very um, uh, sort of anxiety filled time for patients, this trying. Um, they're hoping for the best and some of them are expecting the worst. Um, so we always have them stand up and look at the mirror. Mm -hmm. It hangs on a wall in my operatory. And then we have a bench in front of every one of them too. So they can't get too close. So they're not like, <laughs> right up in their face. Um, so they can only, they can't get any closer than three feet. Occasionally I have someone trying to kneel on the bench and we say, hey, 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 none of that. Um, so they're looking at it at the same distance the real world would see them in. Um, yeah. And if they like it, then we sign a consent again. So there's a second consent that says, I approve them and I'm gonna have them permanently cemented. And it also says in the full consent that if I wanna make any changes, it's, it's gonna cost me. I will have to pay to have a new one made. So this helps us a lot um, with people that want to change things later because sometimes people that are very focused on um, minute details tend to stay focused on them and um, want to make changes and changes and changes. So this shuts the door on that. So this time, this is, we're doing um, seven, eight, nine, and 10. We lay them out on a grid um, and get them prepared. So these will have to be clean. They have try and cement in them, right? So they're gonna to have to be rinsed, then they get cleaned with IvoClean and they get put into this grid. Then they get their silenator on them and put into this grid. We always know where they are the whole time they're being processed. So there's no mistakes. Um, so I'm gonna clean with IvoClean. My assistant's actually doing this. And then she's rinsing them out and we tape a headrest cover, clean headrest cover onto the side of our uh, bench. And she's rinsing into that as opposed to rinsing, it, rinsing into a sink or a garbage can. and um, that's some experience speaking there. <laughs> but now we only get into clean uh, headrest covers. And if she would happen to drop it, she can just pick it up and keep going. Mm. Um, and then we're silenating them, timing it, the silenation. I'm isolating the teeth. We're etching the teeth. Um, we're applying the adhesive to them, adhesive and resin to the restoration. And then the cement, then they're getting seated mm. on and we're clearing out the extra cement, tack curing them, and then gently curing the rest of the cement, or gently removing the rest of the cement, curing them all on, finishing, polishing, checking occlusion, and then here he is before and after. So definitely like a stronger, bolder look, and um, I think that's the last one we have. Yeah, before and after. You know, it's a, it's a stronger, um, more present look and um, it's it's a look that he really wanted and he likes. So, you know, you could argue, is that a huge difference? It's a little bit of a difference, certainly a shade difference and a shape difference. And, um, but what I feel good about is it was done with virtually no prepping at all. So um, I feel confident that these veneers, because they're on all enamel, they're going to last him a very long time. And um, when he does need to replace them, he's got plenty of teeth to work with. Right. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's the art is in the subtlety of it, right? You're, you the market is more demanding and educated than it was 20, 30 years ago where the subtleties of what you just did right now would have been lost on a lot of people. And then people wouldn't necessarily be asking for that, but yeah, that's, that's remarkable. That's, I can, I can see the difference. I mean, that when, when you first described to me what the guy didn't like about a smile, it didn't scream to me that those are shortcomings. And now what I see is smile. I don't know if I would like the, the squareness of the centrals, but uh, it's certainly not. And it actually kind of suits them. You know, now that I've seen that and I don't see the old one, uh, you know, people, yeah, it, it, it kind of, it looks natural. I, I know, I, I, I know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I think what's important for me is that he, um, this satisfies him. Yes. You know, this is this is something that makes him feel good about his smile, and um, and this guy was really like you know we talked about it, really sort of educated about teeth. 
he had gone to a lot of um, effort to look at other people's smiles and to kind of know what he wanted. And then we go through the process of doing a prototype. I feel really good about um, that this is what he wanted. And, um, and I think what's also equally as important is that it's able to be accomplished without removing his teeth. So um, I, I think so much of this has to do with listening to um, what the patients want and acknowledging that their, um, that their desire to have different or um, more perfect teeth is valid. Um, you know, every, every generation has different expectations for um, what are, what's considered beautiful or um, attractive, right? And this is kind of what's going on now. Um, yeah, and as and long as we're doing it without, without doing, um, without doing harm, I feel, I feel really good about it. No, absolutely. And, and these three people don't look like card carrying people that would come to my mind when you were talking about, you know, the selfie generation, the Instagram generation, I was thinking much more of an extreme personality, much more of an extreme look. So this desire and this want that you're speaking of in this market trend is, is uh, it appears to be much deeper and pervasive than, than I naturally thought. Because when you were talking about those cases, I was expecting to see some, you know, more obviously aesthetically driven people, you know, were perhaps a little over the top. But these are just, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, just, just you know, relatively normal people, regular people, not, you know, extremes. Yeah, yeah I, I, I completely agree with you. I see, yeah. I, I definitely see um, younger people that are, are um, seeking out sort of that really extreme too, but you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that's why I brought these cases. These are absolutely, um, uh, you know, mainstream yeah. um, people that I think all of these people are, um, all of these guys are really um, typical of their generation and um, and they're typical in their generation in that they're um, tuned into social media, that they're tuned into their own appearances, but they're also like, they're also health conscious and um, like they all take care of themselves. They're mm -hmm. all, um, they all are concerned about um, fitness and um, they also are concerned about um, that they, I think they also really know that their uh, dentistry or their dental health is a reflection of the rest of their fitness. Yeah, yeah, I you know uh, these people, yeah, it uh, definitely espouse that. They, they all look, you know, healthy and they don't appear to be extremes of society at all. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's, it's that's quite interesting because, yeah, it, my, my prejudice was um, crushed there a little bit because initially when you were talking about that, I, was, <laughs> I mean, we've all been there. Uh, where you see those people and they just can't help doing that. Well, these people don't necessarily be those ones who are just over the top, self obsessed. It's just a, it's a new market trend, and it's the yeah. No, these are like these are these are these are typical of their generation yeah. for sure. I think. Yeah. Um, I think that's why we're seeing so much of it that it isn't just extremes. It's kind of like you said, pervasive in the entire uh, in, the, in that entire age group. Um, yeah. 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 So. Huh. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Uh, and yeah, it's, I can see why this would consume your day and be so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I appreciate your time tonight. It's been yeah. really fun to be here. Um, you know, we always say you can boost your, their confidence and boost your bottom line. Um, it, yeah. 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 I know. Well, yeah, your time is worth something and your expertise is worth something. And if you're getting great results, don't undersell undersell yourself right right and uh, for sure and um yeah. and and i think it's so easy um if you have a busy practice if you're um if you're not sort of like attuned to this to be um maybe a little dismissive when or or just not um just don't realize it just don't spend the just don't put the attention to um kind of the, the wants and desires of the, like this whole generation and um, it consumes my days. This is how I've spent most of my days um, doing just this kind of work. And um, um, I'm always looking for ways to do it more conservatively to, to make sure that um, I'm delivering without taking away their teeth. 
Yeah, I, I could see where your uh, population would develop because if if you're a general dentist and and you have you know your day booked and you're working away, I mean these would be the type of people you would just be a little quick exam. Everything's perfect. Bye bye. See you in six months. You know. Right. And 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 uh, that's not necessary. And they're like, no, no, no. Hang on a minute. I want I want a little bit more. And you're like, are you kidding me? You're you want to more than perfection these 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 smiles are brilliant and if they don't get that attention um then then yeah they have to go elsewhere for it and i could see some of those offices that they come from going what How, like yeah so yeah it's something i've never come across before and yeah it's fascinating and so that's that's how that's how uh, your practice developed you it must be a tremendous word of mouth because then they'll go talk to their friends and their friends will be like, I want that too. So do they say, I want a Susan? Or do they say, I want a McMahon? <laughs> I want a McMahon. <laughs> Neither one. <laughs> um, yeah, this has turned in, like, I, I see, I, I would say um, probably 40% of my practice is now younger people. Yeah. And, um, I, and also because of this, I, I do a ton of accident work. So sports injuries, car accidents, and it's all in this sort of... Um, the same age range. Yeah. So, um, and it, the principles are the same. Um, when someone fractures their teeth, we have an opportunity to not just fix them exactly back the way they were, and sometimes we do that, but it's also an opportunity to, to find out if they needed anything else, if they had any other concerns. Yeah. No, that was absolutely wonderful. No, thank you so much. It uh, opened my eyes. Well, this is, this is fun yeah. for me. It's been great to spend a little bit of time with you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, no, absolutely wonderful. So it, it'll come up on the Peer Effect site in a couple weeks' time, and then some people will ask some questions, and you'll be on the, you'll have access to the site, and you'll be able to answer and such things. And I can append any articles or any other things to it as well. Um, yeah, you, you send me the power. Well, the PowerPoint's on there. Yeah, we don't even need that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, we'll we'll keep in touch. So thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hit stop on the record, but we can chat again. But thank you. Susan, it was wonderful. Good night. Good night. <laughs>